Hello and welcome to this online discussion with the creative team behind Hope Mill Theatre's production of The Wiz. My name is Joseph Houston and I am co-founder and artistic director at Hope Mill Theatre. We're going to go around everyone and if you could just introduce yourself, your role, and just sort of give a brief description of what um, your role um, involves uh, with regards to some of the, the, the job the responsibilities that you have when working on a production. So let's start with Simon. Uh, morning, everyone. Um, so my name's Simon Kenny. I am the set and costume designer uh, on The Wiz. And um, essentially that means that I'm sort of responsible for the look of uh, all of the set, all the costumes, basically everything that you see on stage that isn't a person. Um, and um, generally I, I'll work with uh, the director and the rest of the team to kind of come up with the ideas and kind of how that might work and then I'll work with a team of builders and costume makers and painters to bring those ideas into reality. Great, thank you. Tony. Hi, uh, morning, my name's Tony Gale, I'm the sound designer. Um, yeah, so whereas Simon's um, responsible for everything that you see, I'm responsible for everything that you hear. So. Um, very much uh, music, live music, recorded music, live vocals, sound effects, um, basically everything that is there to help tell the story and help build the creative vision of the director and um, and choreographer and light and the whole creative team's vision of the show, I'm sort of responsible for. Um, so yeah, so I'm responsible for the audience's um, oral um, yeah, in, in experience. Great, thanks. And Chuchu. Hi everyone, my name is Chuchu Nwagu. I'm one of the producers on The Wiz. My role is very varied depending on what position you come onto a production. It can be anything from if it's in the West End, raising money. Other times it could be sourcing the venue, building a creative team, looking at different sort of development of new writing. So again, it's really varied and again there's always something to do and always many surprises that come out of that role as a producer as well so yeah great sean morning hi i'm sean and i am the uh orchestrator arranger and musical supervisor of the show uh my job is to uh well first of all is arranging arranging the vocals and the music orchestrating it so basically uh deciding which instrument plays what deciding which instruments are in the band and then supervising is to do with uh, overseeing the music working with the musical director and the band to make sure that the singers and the band sound the way uh I envision it to working alongside the director choreographer taking ideas from them as well uh, to incorporate it all into the music. Great and last but not least Matthew. Uh, morning everyone if you're watching this in the morning uh, my name is Matthew Zia I'm the director of The Wiz. Um, what's my job? I think to have like an overview uh, to have some some key ideas that other people can jump on board and play with and and start to wrangle with and work out what this world's going to be um so i work very closely with with kind of simon initially to work out what our world is and, and why we're in that world uh and then that's influenced by conversations with sean and the way that music's happening and then that's further influenced by conversations with with leah the choreographer and simi the lighting designer uh and then once we start to get into the space conversations with tony about how how we want it to sound and, and resonate in the space so um Facilitating other people's brilliance is a big part of my job, I think. Great. And yeah, it's worth adding that we do have a lot of other creatives um, that aren't able to join us um, uh, for this webinar. Um, but I think there'll be you'll meet them along the way and hear about how they've helped create this show as well. And we're starting with the foundations of creating a show uh, from an idea um, and getting it to a point where we're ready to bring all these incredible creatives on board. Chuchu, I wonder if we could start with you talking about, from a producing point of view, um, where that journey starts, what that involves, and then how we get to the point where we're starting to bring people together um, and, and then uh, starting to really build um, a musical like The Wiz. Yeah. 
So it all starts with an idea, essentially, and the idea can come from anything from an original idea, something you've seen in the newspaper, something you read in a book. It could come from a film. It could easily be a artist that you've heard their songs and you really want to create a story out of them. It could be an autobiography. And I think once you've got the basis of what that story is, it's then about, okay, who would be the right people around to tell that story? And sometimes it could be that you get the writers on board first. Sometimes it could be that you get the director on board first. Again, it's just whatever process you feel natural, most comfortable. And then from there, it takes a good couple of years to flesh out what that story is. Some of those, some of the story is developed as you do readings, as you do workshops, as you do development labs, and essentially what the, but also some of it's informed by timing and climate as well. As you're doing it, there could be an influential event that happens in society that really informs, okay, this would be a really good addition to what we're writing. But also as you then move into the spaces, you get a clear idea of where is this being presented? If it's in London, could it inform some of the writing? Is it regional? And you have a bit of a look through there. And then from that process, once you get to a place where you feel comfortable with the piece and the and development of that production, then you would look at potentially a venue. And from that point, the various different pieces of the jigsaw start coming together. So, okay, we've got this venue, who'd be a great lighting designer? Sound, what will it look like? Who do we need on board to make that work? Then you start thinking, do we need to raise money for it? Is this something we potentially need to go to the Arts Council for, for grant funding? And all of those conversations start to happen. And some of those conversations can happen from day one. Some of those conversations might happen two or three years down the line. Sometimes you've got musicals that are in development for five, six, seven, eight years before they're really shown to anybody. Some of those shows will open regionally, off West End, off Broadway. Some go straight into the West End. It's about finding that process which is natural for that project and natural for the times you're in as well. But also then making sure that whatever story you have, you're comfortable with and you're passionate about, as it is essentially your baby that you might be developing for God knows how many years. And if you don't believe it, get every hurdle, you'll probably want to walk away. So I think having that belief in that project and having that belief in that story and who that story is for as well from the very offset. I think for all of us, when we're talking about the weirds, why now? Who is this story for? I think that's an important marker to have in the back of your head from the very start as well. Great. And Matthew then go um, and, and keeping in line with, with that um, feeling of building it from the foundations up. And when you then come on board as a director, uh, what process do you go through to start building your wider team? Um, and eventually, of course, then going on to the casting process as well. Yeah, well, I think I think Sean might have been on board this before I was, which was, was uh, brilliant, uh, which meant that there was already some ideas kind of kicking about. Uh, I think normally it's kind of starting by reading the play, isn't it, and working out who you want to bring in to help collaborate on that. I think with The Wiz, we knew that uh, we wanted everybody to be kind of black or global majority in terms of the creative team because of the, the sensitivity of the material. Uh, and I guess the fact that it feels like this kind of cultural artifact that's kind of been handed down generation to generation from the 70s. Uh, so there felt like some responsibility there. Um, and then you're also thinking kind of, practically what does it require uh you know so some of the thoughts i had was uh or were um i hope it was quite a small intimate space uh it's a large musical uh start thinking about humans who have done small intimate musicals and large musicals and then start thinking about simon kenny uh and his production of assassins or his production of sweeney sweeney todd um which came to mind and then we start having a conversation but like i say it's all everything is influenced and then further influenced as you keep having a kind of creative conversation about it. Um, I think as soon as we knew that we wanted it to be kind of global majority or black, it, it just starts kind of limiting who's available really because there aren't as many people uh, in, in various roles, particularly when you get into technical design like lighting and sound. Um, so we go to the great and the good Tony Gale uh, fairly quickly and start having that conversation uh, who works on every musical in the world, uh, not just ones with, with uh, black folk in them. Um, but yeah, so I think that's it. And, and with this, the question was, how do we make this 1970s, very American, 
super soul music or relevant and contemporary to an audience that's going to walk into a theatre today in Manchester. Um, Simon started talking about having seen the space, how it related to an underpass, uh, quite long, deep and narrow, and this idea of this, this young girl going on a journey and coming out the other end, and I think that's kind of where we started. Uh, Sean had already started creating music, which started having influence on, on characters. Um, so, for example, the Winged Monkeys soundtrack was incredibly funky. Very, that was, that was one of the most seventies pieces, I'd guess, in in the show. So we started thinking, okay, what does that look like, sound like, feel like? Um, I guess, which is how we ended up in a kind of New York seventies esque, eighties esque gang culture with the. Um, the jean jacket waistcoats with the insignia stitched into the back and things like that. So like everything has a knock on effect. Um, I think the big thing I try and do early on is have a big idea, like a big conceptual idea. And, and with this, it was that I'd recently watched WandaVision and realized that uh, Wanda had sought refuge in a kind of safe space that had exploded out of her uh, so she could process her trauma and her grief. And I was going, well, actually, what if young black children at the moment are seeing all these images on television and feeling a similar sense of, of kind of grief and trauma. Where do they need to go? Where's their safe space? Uh, so Simon and I kept coming back to that as an idea. Uh, and I think that it really kind of influences how the show starts and how the, the world of Oz kind of explodes out of the television and, and pulls her into it in a way. You mentioned that um, uh, Sean came on very early in the process. So Sean, um, going uh, to your job role, which sort of takes on almost three roles in itself and um, I wonder if you could talk about going back to when you first approach a project like this and um, you know where do you begin what what's the first when do you actually start going okay I'm going to start actually putting notes in and writing and or, or is that later on in the process is it more discussing what you want it to sound like because obviously our um, production of The Wiz is reorchestrated so although it's of course uh, very much uh, based on the original orchestrations it's very much been changed and influenced by other pieces of music so I wonder if you could expand and take us into that whole process. Yeah sure so yeah I was on board quite early I think and uh, I, I remember that, that we had to reorchestrate because the original orchestration is for maybe 14, 15 pieces. It's an, it's an awful orchestra with harp and like strings and brass and everything. And, and we unfortunately couldn't, couldn't afford the amount of players to actually make that happen. So there was talk about well, reorchestration. And in that conversation, I remember thinking, is it a case of just reorchestrating what's there? Or is it a case of reimagining what's there? And for me, the reimagining would have been much more interesting for me as a, as a orchestrator and, and a musician. That's always more interesting than just recreating, but smaller, um, reducing. Uh, that's what the word is. Um, so I think w the first thing that happened was when we decided that actually we were going to reimagine, reorchestrate the whole thing. I then began to question what it could be and what I would like to hear if I was going to see this show, having had a relationship with it before. It, it, in Amdram and as a kid, I was a munchkin at 10 years old. Um, I think I began to ask what if and what could it be? And then I kind of came up with the idea of uh, a, like a love letter to black music in general, like lots of different genres and kind of the idea of this fantasy land meant that there was no kind of limits to the imagination and creativity that I could kind of draw from and, and the the influences I could draw from I didn't have to be um you know uh chained down to one idea that with it being a fantasy land and her meeting all these crazy new people that she could just we could just draw from all these amazing new um influences and various ones from all around the world which is really exciting um and then that led me to well if I can do that why am I doing that and then I linked it back to the characters and I started thinking about who the characters are, how old they are, for instance, and what that might say about the music that accompanies them. So, for instance, with the Friends, they all have very different types of music. And just briefly, I was going to go too, too um, geeky, but in, in Ease and Down the Road, each time a friend joins, the bridge represents the music that represents them. So the bridge in Ease and Down the Road 1 is very different to the bridge on Ease and Down the Road 2 
for the scarecrow and the tin man and the lion etc so kind of everyone has kind of a certain style of music that represents them throughout the show which kind of gave me something really interesting to get my mind around and play with i forget did i answer the question yes you did very beautifully thank you <laughs> and and thinking about that the, the music and uh, obviously the music part of it because of course uh, you know you have to have those arrangements there in place really before you know rehearsals start and you know Matthew you can get an idea of how the show's going to sound and Leah the choreographer beautiful choreographer that's joined us also has to start working with that material as well because of course that then influences what she's going to create you know Tony with regards to how it's going to sound in the space you know when do you come on in the process are you having conversations with Sean you know before we even get into the theatre to start um, setting up in the design with regards to how it's going to sound and what you're going to need equipment wise you know technically yeah uh, yeah absolutely I mean the first thing once I'm on board uh, normally having a conversation with Matthew I sort of understood what the vision was and where we we're going with it pretty early on so it's like right as soon as you know what the direction is and what the end goal is then everything else sort of falls in place as long as you know and do your research and you know um properly so you know first thing is you listen to the demos that sean made which were great you know and you know that has been updated and, and changed but you know you keep listening to it like, right okay i know how this is supposed to sound in a in the real world i mean um in, a, in an auditorium um and you know and my job is which um you know, which is sometimes easy and sometimes hard is to reproduce exactly what the orchestrator and director envision the sound, the show to sound like, and then plant that in the space. You know, um, you know. So, and, and that's that's the interesting and and very creative part for me because it's translating it. So anyone can put on a CD or you know a, a listen to spot, stream some music and say, oh, that's how I want it to sound. But sounding from your computer, that's nice, nicely produced or recorded in a studio is completely different than having live instruments, live vocals a live space you know uh, uh intimate space uh, you know um so yeah so you're dealing with a live element so um yeah, so once it really starts when i get into the theater when i've got all the elements around me so you know and that's from you know and prior to that i'm choosing which equipment i can i can use that will do the job um, within budget and within the space uh, limitations um and also choosing the right team you know sound operators um some of the radio mics and working out exactly what we need sound wise to um to develop the show um you know because last thing you last thing you, you, you don't want is for a cast of say 16 and there's only 10 radio mics you know it's like well six people are not going to be heard so you know, it's the straight way you know, simple things like that thing you've got to make sure we have a radio mic for everyone that's 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 standard um but it's little things like that that you know can easily be forgotten if you're not if you take, take keep your eye take your eye off the ball um but yeah, and then once we're in the space, it's just working with the band, uh, uh, the cast, vocalists, um, and working with Simon as well, because, you know, I, I have to negotiate where I need to put speakers or uh, phobe speakers. You know, it's a, it's a complete collaborative process. Working with Simi, the lighting designer. Um, um, so, uh, you know, because we're sharing the same space, space, you know, and we've got to negotiate real estate up in, you know, up in the grid or in the pros. Um, and then also working with Leah to make sure that she doesn't, um, do too much work with the choreographers, so sorry with the, with the cast that you know um, that so they can sing because <laughs> at the end of the day you know if, if they're busting the groove and, it, and it's too much um, and they can't sing their knackered then you know we have to compromise. So it's it's a it's a massive collaboration with everyone. Leah, I wonder if you could just introduce yourself um, and your role within the production, and then I will come back to you um, with a question. But it'd be great for you to introduce yourself. Hello everybody, um, my name is Leah Hill. I am the choreographer of The Wiz, and that is my role along these beautiful people. Fab. And just going back to still uh, the early process of creating what the show is going to be, Matthew of course mentioned, Simon, that um, he comes up with a concept, an idea, and then he throws it onto you. And then what you have to do is you have to actually make it a thing. So you have to, the costumes have to be there. The, they have to look a certain way that the set has to be there. And again, I wonder if you could just go back to then when you've got all that information of what that, that concept is and that idea, how you then take it all the way through a process of, of um, making it reality. Um, yeah, sure. So when, um... 
when Matthew and I first spoke about it, he presented me with his kind of uh, the kind of big conceptual ideas, and we listened to a bit of the music that Sean had started putting together and kind of uh, taking all of these ideas of the different references and the different different influences that we kind of wanted to build into the piece. So that was always kind of the bed of it. Um, but I guess the way that I uh, like everyone's design process is different. Every designer you talk to will have a kind of different way of approaching stuff. But the thing that I really enjoy doing is uh, I spend a lot of time just talking to the director and we kind of have lots of meetings and lots of chats. And I try to not show anything visual at all, because I often find that um, it's like personally, if I kind of look at something visual too early on, then I kind of get stuck on that idea and um and try and kind of shoehorn that into it. Whereas what I really enjoy doing is getting under the skin of what the piece is and what it should be. So we spent quite a lot of time just talking about what the story was, how it might be staged, what it meant. Um, Cause I think, um, I think generally we, uh, we think of um, set and costume design as the things that we see on stage. And of course, like that's important. That is, um, it's important kind of what it looks like, but I'm also interested in why it looks like that. And I think that's the kind of fundamental thing kind of underneath all the design design decisions that, that we make. So um, anyway, so we'd spent kind of quite a long time talking about kind of what the, what the piece was, what it meant, why we wanted to do it, why it was interesting, what these influences might be. And then um, I came up to Hope Mill to have a look at the space. And that was sort of like the final piece of the jigsaw because I'd not been up there before I'd seen some photos. Um, but um, it was kind of go, walking into the space that really kind of gave me a sense of kind of what it, what our version of it could be. Um, and um, I was lucky when I walked in, there was nothing in there at all, not even the seats were, were in there. So it kind of suddenly presented with this kind of very long, deep, thin space with quite a low roof. And as Matthew mentioned, there was a kind of sort of uh, underpass feeling about it. And it's something we'd spent a bit of time talking about kind of an urban environment for it and a street environment, not, um, like as we've kind of said throughout it's kind of like there's no farms there's no hay bales it's kind of like it's set in it, it's Manchester um so kind of being seeing that space for the first time and also the kind of walk up from the station and kind of going through kind of residential areas and walking under railway bridges and stuff it kind of it felt like a kind of natural ending to um to kind of that journey up there so all of those ideas kind of fed into how we might want to approach it um but also knowing that we'd want Oz to be this kind of fantastical big pop of colour and so my kind of leap into that really was kind of using the graffiti and using the street art and um, knowing that we kind of wanted to because of kind of what the theatre is and kind of where it is and what it stands for kind of like wanting to use kind of local people local artists kind of in the creation of that so um, quite quickly we settled on this idea of um, this kind of spray painted space and were, we worked with a local um, a spray artist called Riz who came in and did all of the artwork based on the designs that I kind of made him, um, made for him. Um, so that was the kind of way into the set side of it. Um, and then kind of worked with builders and production managers to actually kind of realise that. So there's a whole kind of other team of people who actually do all of the hard graft um, and kind of get all the physical stuff into the space. Um, on the other side of that, the, on the costume end of it, um, that felt like it was much more um, aligned to this idea of kind of lots of different references and kind of who these characters were and um, the different styles of music. And so kind of as Sean was feeding in the music, um, sort of uh, was kind of like drip feeding song by song, we were kind of getting more ideas about each character as they were coming up. And because, because the whole sort of approach to it was that we're not set in one specific time and place, um, that was really freeing in kind of how we wanted to approach the um, the kind of costume world of it as well, because it meant that all of these characters could coexist, even if they come from slightly different spaces and slightly different times and slightly different musical genres. But the fact that we meet them all in that one space means that it's fine for them all to exist there. So um, yeah, for various characters, we kind of lent into slightly different references. Some was kind of more Caribbean, some was more African, some was more uh, European, some was uh, very British, some was, uh, kind of some was very now some was very 70s it's kind of like all sorts of different things but just each each of them felt right uh for those particular characters and then I also worked alongside I had an associate costume designer on the project called Maybell who can't be with us this morning um and she worked with me to kind of develop those characters and then also 
to uh, she did amazing work with a costume supervisor to kind of source all the costumes and get things made and get things fitted and then worked with all the cast. And I think we ended up there's about 70 costumes across the whole show, um, which all kind of fit uh, the different characters and the different numbers in kind of lots of different ways. But um, so essentially all of these different ideas from all over the place kind of led to kind of making what looks like quite a, a, a sort of eclectic, slightly chaotic design. But um, like my favorite moment is almost like the curtain call when you see lots of different people from lots of different worlds all suddenly on stage at the same time, um, which in its own right shouldn't make sense. But because of the story, because of the journey that we've been on with everyone, we kind of understand what that all means when they all come together. Thanks, Simon. And in keeping with the, the, the music side of things, um, that music, of course, uh, has to be manifested in some way into some sort of movement. Uh, Leah, I wonder if you could start to talk about the process that you go on as a choreographer. So when you're first getting sent, you know, demo tracks from Sean, you know, then what you're doing uh, creatively. And of course, you know, when you're then in the room and Matthew's giving some uh, ideas as a director, how that then influences the work that you end up creating as well. Um. Yeah, totally. Um... I think from, I guess, my, my initial process is um, after my first conversations with Matthew and then many that follow after that, you do start to get kind of injected with like visuals, in, in my opinion. Um, and then it's only when I'm handed music necessarily, I then start to, uh, you know, explore how the show moves, how people move and why they move the way that they do. Um, and I think the why is just as important as how, um, so that we're in keeping with the story and that we're really identifying each character, each place in a, a, a different world. Um, you know, the music uh, really, really influenced pretty much everything I chose to do and why. Um, uh, and I think the, uh, you know, the, the the choreography aspect I think is also an uh, evolving and ever sort of developing thing in my opinion I don't think it's you know you can make up an eight in January and expect it to be the same by the time it gets to December that's you know that's not how it goes and I think there's something freeing about that uh, especially as you're moving along the process throughout rehearsals you know Simon's coming in and he's saying so you're thinking you know we're going to be having this color and this person's going to be I'm like oh okay that that helps with this and you know my my brain is bubbling even more um exploring you know just different avenues um really helps uh, build a real big pot of different languages um that Sean really pushed forward in the music you know I was able to explore with dubstep and sort of samba-esque sort of movement, uh, African sort of styles, uh, really vogue like things that necessarily wouldn't happen in one show, let alone, you know, one year. So um, it was really, really nice to kind of have the room to explore and um, continue the, the growth and the journey throughout rehearsals, um, as well as like using everyone that, that uh, has made all of this come together. Now that we've built this really incredible, vibrant, exciting, you know, unique foundations for a show, um, of course, then we need uh, talented individuals to to then tell the story. Uh, Matthew, I wonder if you could briefly tell us about the, the process you go through working with uh, casting the show. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, we uh, get a casting director on board. Um, Again, it felt because of the specificity of this kind of, uh, in terms of ethnicity, it felt really important to have someone who was uh, uh, black or black mixed race. And Ryan Carter came on board, uh, initially supported by by Ann Vossa as well. Um, and we begin having conversations. I mean, essentially, I create a breakdown which says this is what we're looking for, uh, and that might be about particular kind of physical attributes. It might be about particular talents or a particular vocal range that we're in need of to deliver the work. Um, we start having conversations again between us. Uh, so Leah's like, I need some incredible dancers for this show. The music that is being made means that we need some people who can do tricks and flips and, and pick up choreography really quickly. So that became a kind of requirement for the ensemble, but also then some of the principles as well. Um, you know, we start talking with Sean about, Again, like the scarecrow is 
both lead, leaning into analogies of kind of uh, street savviness and homelessness, uh, but also the man is made of straw. So, so like, how does that work physically? What do we need for that? Um, and then we go out and, and we did two things. So we do a kind of specific ask where we, we look on uh, kind of databases and catalogues like Spotlight and try and find individuals, but also we did an open call, which meant we just put it out into the world and we said, if you want to be a part of this, then come on in um, and we'll put you for a series of, of small trials, I guess, uh, of, of to see whether you can do the material in terms of singing and dancing and acting. And then we'll collectively sit around and have a conversation and work out what that team is going to look like. Um, and for me, that's, there's a lot of negotiation that happens there, you know, like, uh, well, if we can have this in this person, can we pick up the lack of that particular skill somewhere else in the ensemble or somewhere else in the company? Uh, are there enough people to cover roles? What happens if this person goes off sick? Is there someone here who can take that role? So there's a lot of uh, collaboration, like, like with every other way that we, we work towards this piece, ultimately. Um, I'm blown away. I'm really blown away by that cast uh, every time I see them. And when I look at the pictures that we did before we'd gone into the rehearsal process, I'm like, who knew they could do that? I mean, we, we all thought we knew they could do that, but who really knew that they could do what they're up there doing? Um, so they are the ultimate final collaborator, I always think, kind of, you know, or penultimate other than the audience who come in and collaborate with us nightly. Um, but I think that, you know, sure, um, sorry, Simon, I think we'd probably say a similar thing in that the conversation then continues when the actor is involved about, well, is this going to inhibit your movement? Is this going to accentuate your movement? What, uh, you know, uh, what sort of royalty are you, for example? Um, and again, I was just thinking when, when you were all talking, like a real clear example is Sean pushing he's the whiz into a kind of reggae-esque vibe. Then Sean and I, um, Simon and I then saying, um, Okay, so what is what is kind of mysticism and magic in the world of the Caribbean, and that leading us towards a kind of a Haitian voodoo priestess, and then that influencing the the shifts and the moves that Leah's then going to have when it takes that reggae twist in the song. <clears throat> so that's what I mean, like the collaboration, and then of course Tony going, okay, so it goes reggae, so we really need to hear that dub kick in when we get to that point, and still hear the vocals over the top of it. So it's just a series of like creative provocations, I think, ultimately. Absolutely. And I think that that is very evident when you come and watch our production of The Wiz, because all of the elements just come together and it's just about the experience. Um, and you would never know that we've gone through this process and, you know, this creative journey that you've all just discussed, because ultimately it's come together and it works. And um, sort of um, looking more individually at how you have all come to be in this industry and, and in your roles, because I think it'd be really great for people to, you know, every journey, um, and the creative arts is, is very different. Um, you know, some of you may have trained at establishments, um, some may have come through community theatre, or it'd be great if you could just go around and, and just tell us briefly how you found yourself um, and the roles that you now have in an industry, um, and whether you did require any qualifications along the way, or whether you got through it uh, through other pathways. Um, and yeah. If we could go around again in the order that we sort of introduced, so Simon. Um, so I, um, I mean, I got into doing theatre design at school, really, like quite um, so as I was a teenager. I my two favourite subjects at school were art and drama, and then I suddenly realised that um, I was a terrible, terrible actor. And um, I had a brilliant drama teacher who suggested that um, this might be something this might be a job that I might be interested in. I'd never really thought about it or heard of it. Um, and went and looked into it and um, felt like it's, it would be a really exciting, interesting thing to do. So kind of got involved at doing basically the school productions and uh, like painting the backdrops and doing all that. And from there I went, I did go on and train. So after my A-levels, I did a, a art foundation course for a year and then I did a degree in theatre design. Um, and then since then I've been working either as a designer or I've done some scenic painting um, on other people's shows or I've assisted other designers um, in sort of like kind of earlier part of my career. Um, but yeah, so I kind of did, it was actually quite a, I guess quite a traditional route 
into the industry from um yeah from from a teenager really but um there's various people around me and kind of various colleagues of mine who've had kind of many many different routes in who some have trained some have had much more traditional training some have had completely different careers and then decided to kind of sidestep into it some have kind of found an interest in it much later on um so yeah i had quite a traditional route but that's by no means the only way uh, into it great tony uh, yeah um so yeah i mean I, I i was born into a jamaican family so therefore uh, by default if anyone knows any jamaicans you know i mean if someone opens a window they're going to celebrate by having a party or having you know playing music or drinking so you know you know very much growing up there's music around me all the time <laughs> so no matter, no matter what the occasion was so i had developed a quite early sense of um you know, musicality quite young even though i'm not musically trained but you know, I, I, you know music is music and you listen to all types of music and so that sort of developed into me you know, working on sound systems like um, local street sound systems um, dj and stuff um, and then also finding that interest thinking oh this is great but then i went i done a two-year college course in uh stagecraft which um which um basically specialized in all elements of theater because at the time i've never stepped foot in a theater you know at the age of 12 at the age of 18 years old um so to see that there was sound involved it's like oh wow this is great and, and it sort of developed from there um i sort of grew up in the in my professional early years in a sound company sound hire company so I learned a lot about equipment, how to use it, how to manipulate it, and, and network and speak to people and just bounce ideas off people, more experienced people um, who've been in the industry a long time. You know, there's a lot of great sound designers who have been around um, for years. There are people like John Leonard, um, Andrew Bruce, you know, people who, you know, sort of invented the modern day um, sound design. Um, and I, had, I was fortunate to be around them and speak with them. And because they're all, because we're such a small knit, small knit community. We can talk to people about you know um, what we do and they, you know, they're always happy to teach and, and i'm always happy to learn so yeah it developed from there and then uh just uh, led me to where i am now so um so not not any real formal training but more specialized training in specific sound engineering um which sort of led me to there and then using mike's life experience and my cultural experience um uh, hopefully sort of um influences how i design shows and how i approach shows but yeah okay. thanks tony choo choo yeah um i don't think i had a normal route into this i like simon loved performing and then soon came to realize that i was a in the words of others a terrible performer i still think i'm quite a good performer and sort of was like i want to remain in this world of performing or theater and the arts but wasn't entirely sure what that world would look like but always knew that i wanted to tell stories because of the way stories made me feel when i went to the theater for the first time and left feeling elated and that experience and it just happened to be i was on a gap year from university was in a coffee bar met a cover number six met a Broadway producer who was like to me have you ever thought about producing after I sort of gave a big spiel about what I wanted to do and then from there I was like no I hadn't really thought about it but that as I said from the start the ability to be in the world of the fit and the arts but being able to work from it from so many different components whether it's building that team working with the director, sometimes finding those stories and how each and every part of that leaving that theatre when I first went to see that musical being like, yeah, this is what I want to create and this is the experience and how that gave me the autonomy and the freedom to do so. So I think that's sort of how I fell into this world and it came with hurdles and challenges along the way but I think for one of the biggest qualifications that I felt I needed was belief and tenacity and you know people go and do creative producing courses people go and do all sorts of courses to get into producing but I think ultimately if you do not have belief and if you do not have tenacity you will easily the first hurdle you will just want to walk away because it is often quite easy and I think for me it was always the case of why am I doing this 
why am I here? And even doing the whiz and doing the work I am doing now, like why in 2021 after the last 18 months that we've had, why am I still going at this job when I could probably go into the corporate world and get a completely different job? Why? And what does it mean to me? But what will it mean to so many other people younger than me who are looking up and looking for an inspiration, looking for a role model who 30, 40 years from now will be going to see shows with their names on top as well. So, yeah. Great. Sean. Hi. Um, so uh, I was one of those kids who did Saturday morning drama school um, at, from about the age of five or six, had lots of energy. Um, and I also started playing the piano at about age five too. Um, so I did both of those things growing up, was in Amdram right up until I left to go to uni. Um, I did a music degree, classical music degree um, originally. But while I was doing that, I was part of the group at university that did musicals. I wasn't really interested in cl classical music so much by that point, but I was doing the degree, so I was there. Um, but I did choreography, um, musical direction, and I was in the shows as well. And then after uni, I didn't quite know what to do. And I ended up again, going back to the Amdrams and uh, MDing the Amdrams. Um, and then uh, I then applied for drama school and did a postgraduate musical direction. So that's kind of how I ended up in theater. I had a love of music and a love of theater at the same time. And it kind of naturally combined in terms of orchestrating and arranging. That's something I've always kind of done as well. Uh, I don't, I mean, I suppose the classical music degree is, is a qualification in that, I suppose, but I've always written and produced and had an interest in, you know, producing commercial pop music as well alongside you know musical theater so kind of this show has just been a unique way of kind of incorporating both my passions at the same time which has been really lovely um i think you can easily get into musical direction without any formal qualifications um uh yeah i think because I, I mean i was doing it before i did my degree um and it, you know it's just a case of just being in the right place at the right time having the right piano skills and the right passion for theater and teaching and shaping music for theater um, yeah, I think there, there are multiple ways of coming in. I've, I've met musical directors who have come via gigging, um, the gigging route without any formal training, you know, so it, it's definitely possible from many different ways. Okay. Matthew. Trying to work out which bit of this is relevant and useful. Uh, I was um, a, a troublesome child with a lot of energy that I needed to get out uh, and I found an outlet in my local theatre, which was Theatre Royal Stratford East in East London. Uh, so I joined a youth theatre at 11, I did some acting, uh, I would let the world judge whether I was any good, uh, but anyway I worked out that I didn't want to act anymore, uh, and I'd started DJing at the same time, so I kind of had this love of music and this love of theatre and this love of performance, um, and I just kind of kicked around Stratford East, even once I'd, I'd kind of been picked up by the BBC and had a radio show with the BBC as a hip-hop DJ. Um, and I thought that was going to be how I'd spend the rest of my life. Um, and then at some point, this guy called Baltz was doing an adaptation of a play called The Boys from Syracuse. Uh, and he said, I need a hip hop DJ to kind of adapt all the music for it. Are you up for doing it? And I said, yeah, let's give that a whirl. Uh, and we did that and it went quite well. Uh, and then a bit later on, maybe two or three years later on, he said, oh, I'd, I'd love you to kind of do a similar job adapting this this play called The Blacks by a guy called John Genet into a, a piece of hip hop musical theatre. So I said, okay, we'll do that. Uh, and he said, I'd love you to co-direct it with me. And I said, I don't know what that means, but I'll sit next to you. And he said, yeah, that's kind of what it means. Uh, so I ended up co-directing this piece called The Blacks uh, at Stratford East. Um, and then I really got a taste for like, again, the, the big ideas that sit behind a piece and how you uh, help introduce a piece of art to an audience and create a meaning making process for an audience who are going to derive meaningful conclusions for themselves that they can take home or just have a great night out uh, and, and sneak some politics in in their kind of party bag for them to take home uh, that they didn't even realize were in there. Um, so that's kind of the way in I guess and then um, when I stopped DJing I found a bunch of different schemes that I was able to jump on board and and so I've had again no formal training lots of being in other people's rooms watching other people do it uh, and then I joined the Genesis Directors Network at the Young Vic which is an amazing resource uh, I think it's now called the Creative Network because Kwame has expanded it beyond just directors um, I applied to joined the Regional Theatre Young Directors Scheme and that took me up to Liverpool where I became a resident director there for a bit uh, and then I saw this job 
in Manchester as Associate Artistic Director at the Royal Exchange and I thought I'll apply for that, I'll never get it, but at least I'll have introduced myself to people in Manchester and, and there's another place I could go and work and ended up getting that job um, and then got kind of thrown in the deep end quite quickly when Sarah Franklin went, you know you do those little four-handers uh, in studio theatres and I went, yeah, do you want to do Into the Woods? Uh, and so suddenly I was doing this, you know, 19 performers on stage in the round um, and so started pulling on friends and people I'd worked with at Stratford East. Uh, so Sean was one of those people who I'd known since we, we did a pantomime together there uh, a long time ago. Um, and the designer was someone who'd always worked at Stratford. Uh, John Leonard was the sound designer that I brought in again, who I knew from, from Stratford, who, who Tony mentioned. Um, and I guess that kind of was the, the real start of, of me making work in earnest as a director. Um, so yeah, I'm the product of like a long incubation period in my local theatre. Uh, and then a, a number of schemes to help push me forward. Great. And Leah? Um, I didn't know really what I wanted to do properly until I was about 16. Um, I did an array of things that didn't include performing. Uh, I used to do karate. I was a lifeguard. Uh, I got a scholarship to a tennis school. I did gymnastics. Um, was always doing things, I guess, that involved moving, um, but never really, nothing really stuck. Um, and I, my mom used to work in the Brixton, Re Brixton Recreation Centre, and I would do all of these things uh, in the building, and all of them would be on different floors. So I would start swimming in the morning, bottom floor, blah, 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 work that, work my way up. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I used to go there for years, and the top floor was dancing, where I met um, a young man at that time he was a lot older than me but uh he was a young man at the time uh, called Kenrick and he was running classes at uh, the top uh, for a company called Boy Blue and he would always try and get me to come inside and I would just run away I was just like no no I'm not coming in there um and eventually um I kind of sat and watched a few of these classes and I was like oh, I'd love to do that let's give that a go and yes, yeah, so I started super, super late. Um, I just joined like a weekend sort of school, um, mainly did commercial and street. And then uh, a few of the people I was training with uh, started to go off to like schools, like musical theater schools. Um, and I was really in denial. I didn't, I, I didn't think I really understood what that meant. I just thought, yeah, I'll go um, or I'll give it a go. Um, and uh, I auditioned for uh, a school called Erdang and, uh, I got into there, did a degree there, and then um, uh, did a few shows and worked commercially and uh, danced for artists and a bunch of other things. And uh, with that came, uh, I it started to not become about the jo the the jobs for me. Like when I was doing the thing, I was never really bothered about like not that I wasn't bothered, but I became more excited about the choreographer. I was like, who 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 is it, and how can I be next to them? Um, and that kind of turned into me going from kind of like dance captains to like uh, assistant and always kind of shadowing. So I did quite a few uh, assisting projects for artists as well as film. Um, and I was given the lovely opportunity by Mr. Matthew to have the Wiz be my uh, debut solo uh, choreographic uh, uh, adventure. And um, and yeah, so that's that's how I've got into it. I, I think there are many ways to get into choreography. I don't think you have to, uh, I guess, attend a school. Um, I don't think and not everyone sets out to just be a, a choreographer. I think sometimes you can kind of flip it backwards. Some people, you know, uh, set out to be choreographer at first and then kind of balance in between performing and then not. And some people, you know, there's uh, many different ways. Uh, but, but that was my route, but I feel the, the benefits for me is I understand uh, what performers need eight times a week in order to do a show. Uh, I uh, am able to understand what a picture needs to look like from the outside as well as being in the picture. Uh, so I think going that route or doing the, the route I have has really helped me uh, be, be on the side of the performer, but also be on the side of the creative. So I have two eyes and, and ears um uh, on both halves so uh, and I think there's many ways but that that was my route great and finally um if I was if you were to give um 
advice to someone who wants to pursue the same career as yourself, what would that be, Simon? Um, I think there's two things which I found quite, uh, I mean, there's many things I found important and useful, but two things I will land on. Uh, if you, there's an opportunity to see anything, go and see it. It doesn't need to be live, recorded, any kind of access to performance. Um, it's just really useful. It's kind of for, for two things. It's one, just kind of see what's interesting and what's exciting and what turns you on and kind of what's out there. But then I guess something that I found more useful kind of subconsciously was as I was watching stuff, starting to work out why I found it interesting. And um, that sort of gave me a bit more of an insight into kind of the design process and kind of what it was communicating to me and all of those sorts of things. So I think that's really important. The other thing I'd say is uh, is find your people like find the people that you enjoy working with like it's a making shows is a really intense process sometimes so it really helps if you're around people that you like to be around um because i mean that's that's the joy like it's too complicated and uh occasionally stressful a job or process to do with people that you don't want to be with so uh, once you find those people keep them here, here. And um, Tony. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would say two things. Um, listen to as many genres of music sounds that you, you know, you can hear, you know, whether it's radio, music, spoken word, poetry. I mean, just listen, just listen to stuff. And that will inform you what you like and what you don't like. You know, I mean, everyone's got a different opinion of what sounds right, what sounds wrong. But if you have a, a, a self-identity of knowing what you like then it makes it a lot easier than when you then step into a job or want to work in theatre then you have a you know I identify as I know that sound, sound should sound like that so it makes it easier for, for yourself but then also I would say um, don't be afraid to make mistakes um, I mean experiment don't be afraid to make mistakes as long as you learn from those mistakes um, so yeah I mean, just just throw yourself in there and and knowing that you're self-confident and knowing what set what you want to, things to sound like or how you think it should sound like helps with that as well because you have that conviction to follow it through um you know sometimes i, I i'm in the middle of a room with a bunch of creators and i don't agree with everything they're saying about a certain sound but you try it you listen to it and then halfway through preview it changes back to how you wanted it and you know it's very much because you know, I've got a conviction of I'm pretty certain this is going to work the way I want it to. But you want to collaborate and work with everyone. So, um, you know, I could have been wrong though. You know, I could be wrong. I could have made that mistake, but then I move on and learn from that. So yeah, so that's that's the two key things for me really. Great, choo choo. Um, I think mine would be why you, why now, and what's your USP? As I think often is the case, everybody naturally at some point would be like, I want to be a producer. And I think I often say what the industry doesn't need is yet another producer. What the industry needs is you. And what can you bring to the table that makes you different? What is it that you bring to this industry that other people don't have, which makes you stand out? But when you're cultivating that work, you create opportunities, people want to work with you. So I think it's, what is your unique selling point? What is it that you believe in solely? And that drives you through. So at every point you have that end goal in mind about, this is what I want to achieve in this industry. This is the legacy I want to leave behind. So then that journey seems smooth as opposed to this rocky road that I think often producing can be when, yeah, the, when it's stressful and difficult as well. So, yeah. Great. Sean? Uh, I mean, on top of going to see as many things as you can in the theatre, I'd say uh, play as much as you can and do that with people. Uh, other musicians and also accompany singers. Um, the more you work with people, the, the better your skills will get and the more you'll be open to lots of different collaborative kind of experiences musically. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Great, Matthew? Um, I scribbled down a bunch while I was being inspired by other people. Um, so the first one, I think, if you want to be a director is read plays, consume art, like Simon says, uh, kind of get out there and, and beyond plays as well, live experiences, but also novels, go to art galleries and just consume art, um, get into rooms, 
if you can find a way of getting into the room so you can demystify what the process is of making a play uh, or making a musical. Um, place yourself in the way of opportunity because opportunity doesn't really place itself in the way of you. So you've got to get in front of it and, and seek them out. So go to the theatres, go find those schemes, apply for things. Uh, even if you don't quite think you're ready to get them, still apply for them and you might surprise yourself. Uh, and then I think I've got to quote the show, haven't I, and say, believe in yourself, ultimately, uh, and believe in your vision. Lovely. Leah? Um, I think uh, on top of everything everyone's already said, um, I think just from a choreographic point, I think continue to explore what your language is um, and, and lean into those things uh, and be brave if you, if you find uh, any choreographers that you aspire to or... I get any teachers or any uh, leadership when it comes to devising eights or taking auditions, all that kind of stuff. Uh, be brave and ask, can you shadow? Can I kind of watch? Can I assist? Can I make notes? Uh, I think I think all of those things uh, come into play. Uh, again, like Matthew's saying, just believe in yourself, but um, be brave with, with your choreographic lang language and um, watch. Keep, keep your eyes open. Great. Thank you to all of you, not only for your time um, with uh, on this, um, but for your creativity, uh, passion, hard work, um, honesty on, on this show. I think that um, you've all created, we've all created something really special um, and it has involved a lot of, of hard work um, and passion and creativity. And I think that reads, um, and I just think that, you know, a show like this does have the opportunity to inspire a new generation. Um, and I thank you all for that. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Bye. <laughs>